reduced and in the, uh, it's almost normal in the animals that have been stretched. So they are less responsive to, uh, to pain. Uh, here, she then looked at the tissues themselves to look for macrophages because that's a, a, as a marker of inflammation. She, did, she first did H and E stage where she just looked at, this is just a regular hematoxin nucleus, and you can see here the big inflammation in the carotene. And look how, even you can see it with your naked eyes, just looking, looking at a tissue block, it's less uh, dark in the stretched animals compared with the, the vehicle. And here's the macrophage infiltrate in the carotene, and here is in the stretch, and she was able to quantify that. So there's quite a, a very, very impressive knockdown of the inflammatory response in the stretched animals compared with the non-stretched. She's also able to measure this, although quite, not quite so sensitive, but still it's an interesting technique. We wanted to try to see if we could, um, for future experiments, if we could document this without having to sacrifice the animal. And with ultrasound, uh, here is what it looks like with the vehicle. The carotene is, is quite enlarged here, the subcutaneous tissue, and here it's, it's, it's reduced in the stretch. And she was able to pick that up, although it's not quite as, as statistically significant. There's a little bit more variability in the technique. The other thing, using the same method in mice, we were able to show that the same type of stretch intervention uh, not only decreases inflammation, but it also decreases a fibrosis a following an injury, so the scarring. We looked at pro-collagen 1, which is the amount of new collagen formed in, respon in, res uh, in, uh, um, in uh, response to the injury. And so the, in the injured animal that has been stretched, there's less pro-collagen 1 in response to injury, so less scarring. We also did an experiment in vitro where we looked at the amount of TGF-beta-1, which is one, one of the major cytokines that drives the production, production of fibrosis, and that was also reduced three days following a 10-minute episode of stretching. So stretching appears to have not only anti-inflammatory <coughs> effects, but also anti-fibrotic effects. So what about cumulus? Is there any evidence that there's any type of connective tissue pathology in the presence of chronic you know, pain? So we did a study of uh, 107 human subjects. And uh, this is the thoracolumbar fascia in humans. We put an ultrasound in a probe two centimeters lateral to the midline. And we just take a picture of the thoracolumbar fascia. Here's the skin, subcutaneous tissue, thoracolumbar fascia, and muscle. And uh, here, in people with low back pain, a lot of times, the tissue looks thicker and even may look like that, kind of not only thick but also disorganized. And we looked at how thick the tissue was and how, how, so how echogenic, how many ultrasound echoes were generated by the tissue. And in both cases, it was increased in, in, on average in the group of subjects with uh, chronic low back pain. So it looks like there might be some sort of chronic of connective tissue pathology here going on. And the other interesting thing is, remember I was talking about the relative movement. Uh, the the thoracolumbar fascia is composed of many layers. There, all these different layers correspond to the aponeuroses of the, all the muscles that kind of invest into here. For example, the you know the uh, the um, transversus abdominis and uh, uh, the um, the external internal obliques have a medial collateral direction of pull, uh, as opposed to the latissimus dorsi and the erector's muscles that, that have a rostrocaudal direction of pull. So it would make sense that these layers would need to have some independent motion from each other so that you're not pulling on the entire thoracolumbar fascia every time you contract one of those muscles. And in fact, that's what happens. You can see that you have these equilucent layers separating these different layers that you can resolve with ultrasound. And if you do a test where you put somebody on a motorized table and you're collecting an ultrasound image while the trunk is being passively flexed, in this case, the foot of the table bends back and forth 15 degrees and the subject is lying prone, okay? So that essentially, so passively, you know, stretching their back. And I'm going to show you a movie. Uh, this is a normal subject, okay? So this is rostral and caudal here. And you can see that there's a lot of motion in between the different layers. Can you all see that? So not all the layers are moving at the same rate as the other layers. Some of them are moving faster than others, and even they are moving in opposite directions sometimes, okay? So this is a normal subject. And in contrast, um, here's somebody with chronic low back pain, and you can see there's less motion. It looks like the, either we don't know if the tissues are just stuck together, they're not moving as fluidly, or it could be that the muscles are sort of contracting and, and, and sort of synchronously contracting and they're not uh, allowing as much inspiration motion. We don't know whether this is a, 
uh, an, an abnormality of muscle patterns, or it's actually an intrinsic connective tissue pathology where there's fibrosis and the connective tissues are stuck together. We don't know yet. But we are able to measure this. And we're using ultrasound electrography. I apologize, this slide is a little bit pale. But when you look at the differential movement between these two little blocks of tissue here, representing above and below the uh, interface between the aponeurosis of the multifidus and that of the abdominal muscles. And we can see that in people with low back pain, which I'm going to show you what it looks like with elastography, um, you can see that uh, blue represents movement towards the left, and right represents movement towards the right. I can play that again, sorry. But anyway, you saw there was a big interface between blue and red, indicating the presence of a shear plane. Okay? So it's not that before I was showing elastography, but we were looking at the uh, up and down movement. This actually looks at the sideways movement. And you can see that shear, lateral shear strain between the normal subjects and the subjects with uh, chronic low back pain is quite a bit different. There's a 20% difference in the, um, in the amount of shear uh, strain uh, that it develops at the interface between these two aponeuroses in people with chronic low back pain. So this is just the first you know, attempt at quantifying differential motion between uh, different connective tissue layers, but we show, in fact, that we can actually measure it through that. So in summary, uh, I hope I've convinced you that connective tissue is uh, it, it important and interesting in the body, that uh, a real or loose connective tissue is a dynamic and mechanically responsive network, that fibroblasts actively influence connective tissue tension, that inflammation and movement restriction may impair normal connective tissue function, and may contribute to chronic pain. This is certainly what our, um, our human and animal studies are beginning to suggest, although you know, we don't really know to what extent reduction of function actually directly relates to how much pain a person individual is, is, is experiencing at the moment. And that's very important to, 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 to mention that. Um, but the big question now is, can you treat this? Okay? Can treatment influence connective tissue function and malfunction. So this is a project that we just embarked on, and just to show you how much fun we're having now, <laughs> we just started a project in pigs, because what we wanted to do is we wanted to know, does connective, can connective tissue malfunction be induced in an experimental animal simply by restricting movement? We've shown that stretching is good, right, for connective tissue. Or what about the lack of stretch? What about movement restriction? Because typically when people have low back pain or any other type of pain, they don't move as much. They don't want to move because it hurts. So could it be that restricting movement would lead to connective tissue pathology? Okay. So we decided to try to do this where we restrict the uh, relative motion of the pelvis and the spine, thoracic spine, by attaching one leg to uh, a harness. And what that, what that does is um, at the end of a month, what you see is, you probably can't appreciate this here, but I'm just showing you, because that's how we noticed it for the first time. We, after sacrificing the animal at the end of a month, we just opened up the skin and we looked at the thoracic imperfection. We couldn't believe it. It was, it looked so different. In the, in the control animals, you can see through the layer of loose connective tissue, you see the aponeurosis of the latissimus <coughs> dorsi visually. You don't need a microscope. It's right there. It looked like what we call them guitar strings. They look like these strings of connective tissue. In the hollow animal, you couldn't see them at all. The loose connective tissue on top had gotten so opaque that it was preventing us from seeing the layers on these. That's where we knew we had some pathology. Now we have to figure out how to measure it. But uh, <laughs> so anyway, when we uh, when we took one of our volunteer, very nice technicians who agreed to do this, we put her in a hollow. And what we did is we used motion sensors to look at the relative motion of the thorax and the pelvis. And what you do is, is when, when you put somebody on all fours, it produces a very nice <laughs> counter-rotation of the thorax and pelvis. You can see that in the blue tracing here. Okay? We look at the angle of motion in the frontal plane. And when she had the hollow on, th that motion was quite uh, significantly reduced. And here at the bottom, we have two subjects, one with low back pain and one without. The low back pain is in red. But they're not wearing a hobble, either of them. But you see that the low back pain subjects is walking like they've got the hobble on, okay? They don't have as much uh, counter-rotation of the thorax and pelvis. So that's how we knew that this model was, was relevant. 
So what we're going to do here is we're going to take these pegs and we're going to immobilize. Oh, jeez. Don't do that. Anyway, I'm almost done. So what we're going to do, forget this, is we're going to be able, in these animals, we're going to look at ultrasound, and we're going to look at their, uh, their fibroblasts. We're going to look to see how the fibroblast responds. We're going to look to see how their sensory nerves are responding. And we're going to then try to treat them. And the question is, if you induce connective tissue pathology, can you reverse it with some intervention? So is, does, does stretching of tissue or acupuncture, uh, re can, can it reverse these uh, connective tissue abnormalities? And if so, what is the right dose? So I think that you can see how understanding the, the connective tissue pathology is now hopefully going to lead us to a better understanding of possible treatment mechanisms. So, um, I want to also uh, acknowledge all my contributors uh, that have contributed to this research and a lot of different collaborators in many different areas at the University of Vermont, including pathology, uh, physics, engineering, and, uh, and of course biostatistics, and also funding from the National Institute of Health. Thank you very much.